my fellow assassins to another episode of the Dark Assassins Podcast, the show that dives deep into not just technology, but the concepts, software, and procedures behind it all, and explains it so simply that even your grandma can understand it. As always, I'm your host, the Dark Assassin. So welcome to another weekend, my fellow assassins. I hope you are having a good one. And uh, I know I know last week's episode was kind of dark and depressing, uh, but I feel like this week is going to be a lot more lively and upbeat and a little more fun. And speaking of lively and upbeat and fun, I don't know about you guys, but like I can't believe that literally next weekend is Christmas time. Like, literally, Christmas is next weekend. Like, I don't know where the time went, and then New Year's after that. Like, this year's basically over at this point, and I have no idea where the time went. Um, but don't you worry. I have uh, content planned for you guys for both Christmas and New Year's, uh, so you won't have to worry uh, about missing uh, episodes of the Dark Assassins podcast. I got you covered. Uh, But with that out of the way, let's uh, get into everybody's favorite part of the podcast, or at least maybe my favorite part of the podcast, which is how we start every episode off uh, with what nerdy stuff have I been up to this week? So this week, I actually did a a fair bit compared to compared to last week, especially. Uh, So the first thing I guess I did was I wrote a Python script, which basically allows me to search. It it basically kind of takes the role of um, like a file system search, like rather than searching for like the name of a file Sometimes you don't want to do that. Sometimes you want to search for something in a file. So basically what I did was I wrote a script that allows me to input like a search query. So if I want to search for uh, red rocks or something, um, I can basically put that as the search query. And then I can put like a directory that I want it to search through. And then it'll basically go through every single file in the directory and it'll go down like all the subdirectories and all that jazz uh, and it'll search for red rocks and then if it finds it it'll print out like hey we found red rocks in this file on this line uh, so pretty handy um, I mean I know there's other scripts uh, that do basically the same thing there's other tools that you can use to do that uh, one that comes to mind is grep uh, but you know Where's the fun in using a tool that already exists when you can write your own, right? That arguably has less functionality than, you know, something like grep. But hey, you know, it was fun. Um, So another thing that I did uh, was my router that you remember that I haven't talked about in a while because it was behaving itself. Uh, Yeah, it decided not to behave itself again. Um, and I don't know why, um, and I pretty much just got fed up with it, and, uh, I went with the nuclear option, and basically what I did was I wrote another script that basically checks if I have internet, and if I don't, set off an Ansible playbook that reboots the router, (laughs) so for whatever reason, the router's ethernet card will just randomly like disconnect from the system. I don't I thought it was a heat issue and then I thought I fixed that, but it's apparently still disconnecting sometimes. I don't know why. Um I also had a had that same weird issue where for whatever reason its network speed would just like absolutely tank. So that's kind of strange. So I don't know if it's like the network cards on the fritz or what the deal is. But I'm at least going to try to limp along for a little bit longer with this solution. So basically what's what happens, as I mentioned, is I wrote an Ansible playbook, which I basically already had. I just had to modify it a tiny bit just to fit the router's use case. And then a uh, Python script that basically monitors, monitors if I have internet connection. Um, so because for obviously if I reboot the router, like do a complete reboot, of Proxmox, which it's running on, and then on Proxmox, I have PFSense and a Pi-hole instance running on there as VMs. Um, so when I reboot the Proxmox 
uh once it reboots the i mean the the card comes back up and reattaches just fine which is why i decided to reboot it um so it works um and actually as a bit of a tech tip i guess for you here um if you're ever planning on writing a script like this that runs periodically in the background that you don't necessarily get output to like for instance i'm running this in a cron job which i believe i mentioned cron jobs before uh, but it's basically just a way for you to schedule uh, tasks to run so if you're running something like a cron job or running a service on your system or whatever or something that you basically don't get to see the direct output of it make sure you have a logging system of some kind um like for instance in this example, um, I have it logging, like, you know, with the date and time, and then also saying if the router was up or not, and then if it was up, it just says router's up, everything's good, um, and if it's, if it's not up, it'll be like router or internet is down, rebooting the router, and then it'll also output uh, the Ansible playbook to that log file also, um, and I also have this set up on that other script that I mentioned uh, few episodes back uh, about checking if my IP address changed and that one it's basically very similar it has the date and time logged and then it says if the IP address changed or not and then if it did change it'll be like yep IP address changed from this to this and we're pushing the update now um, and then it'll show the output of the file being copied uh, to my Linode server um, so definitely you want to have those kinds of log files to see what's going on. And the reason why having the date and time is nice is because you can use something like grep, like I mentioned, and what you can do is you can say like, you can cat out the file or basically print the file to the screen and then pipe that through grep for the specific date you want. So literally what I can do is if I want to see... Uh, what happened in the log on, say, December 15th, what I can do is I can type, you know, cat, you know, the name of the log file, pipe it through grep, and then search for the date. I, th I believe the date's formatted like, uh, it's either, I forget exactly how I formatted the date, but, you know, like 2022-12-15 or whatever. Uh, and then I hit enter. And then it'll print out every single entry in the log from that day, and I can see exactly what happened. So if you're ever planning on writing a script that'll run in the background or writing some kind of service, make sure you got log files uh, because they are very helpful to see. One, to make sure your script's working, um, and two, just to you know, kind of check up on it, see what's happening. Um, and like uh, in my case, it's kind of cool to see like if it was able to check if my IP address changed. Um, or if my router was up or down, which actually, since I wrote the script, I haven't had any instances where the router's been down, of course, because, you know, right when I make something to <laughs> fix, I don't know about fix the problem, more of like put a band-aid on the problem, it, it decides to, you know, work without issue, of course. Um, and the other thing that I did was I also installed a new... Um, a new monitoring system. Uh, it's called Uptime Kuma. I'm not sure if you guys have heard about that or not. It was new to me. Um, and it was really cool is it runs in a Docker container, so it was super easy to spin up. Um, and basically what it allows me to do is I can monitor all the different services that I'm running in my home lab. I can monitor uh, my VPN. I can monitor my DNS through our pie holes. I can monitor my Bitwarden, my GitLab, uh, basically anything that I want to monitor. I can even monitor like websites. I have it monitoring my Linode uh, server. I have it monitoring uh, both of my personal websites. Uh, so I got it monitoring some stuff and it's and it's pretty cool. It's It works pretty well. And also speaking of Docker containers, um, I, I've mentioned before on this podcast how much of a royal pain it is to get macOS virtualized and any kind of VM. So I saw this week someone managed to get macOS running in a Docker container. Like they basically put it on easy mode and you basically just 
download and spin up a Docker container, and it has a full-fledged version of macOS working without really any tweaks whatsoever. The only tweaks you make is to, like, your Docker, like, command to set it up. Like, you can, like, change some settings in there. But, like, aside from that, you spin up the Docker container, it's going to take a while because it's got to download a lot of stuff. But, like, it's just done. (laughs) Like, I've never seen... A essentially virtualized version of Mac OS done so easily. It I, I didn't do it myself, but I'm honestly kind of tempted to because of how easy it was to do. Um, I have a link uh, to the GitHub of the guy that that made the the Docker for Mac OS if you're interested in taking a look at it. Um, now to get into the main part of the episode, which the this first topic that we're gonna talk about also kind of uh, mixes in with the nerdy stuff I did this week because it it was something I did this week, but it also I felt like was a good, you know, actual main topic because of just kind of how wild it is. Um, So if you're not familiar with RHEL or Red Hat Enterprise Linux, it is basically Linux that all of the corporate and enterprise people use um, and really what distinguishes it from say uh, like a an Ubuntu or something is the fact that one it's maintained by Red Hat and you have to pay in order to get like the uh, any kind of like updates and access to the repos and all that like you can install Red Hat assuming you can get the ISO uh, you can install it but then you're not able to update any of your packages or update your software at all or install anything else uh, unless you, uh, you know, have a license or link it to, like, your paid subscription or whatever. Um, But with that said, I don't know how recently they did this, uh, but you can actually create a developer account on their website and it, they'll allow you to have up to 16 rel instances which is pretty good uh so you can like you know test and develop your code and all that stuff um but the one thing that's kind of annoying about it is you have to have an account in order to download the ISO in the first place and i wanted to download the ISO because i wanted to play with red hat but I didn't want to create an account. So what I did was I remembered that I also, another thing that I set up a while ago uh, was DuckDuckGo's like private email thing. I forget exactly what they call it, Uh, but basically what it allows you to do is you can create a at duck email address, which basically just forwards to whatever your personal email address is. And then they offer a service for free that you can like generate like essentially random email addresses that'll auto forward to your personal address. So I was like, huh, this seems like a pretty good use for that then because I don't want to make an account. So what I did was I went over to DuckDuckGo, um, created you know a random email address that'll link to my personal email address, uh, created an account with that, and then it asked for like my name and you know address and phone number I was like I'm not giving this so I put in a bunch of random data that you know wasn't anywhere close to related to me at all and they didn't bother checking the phone number like they didn't you know do any kind of like phone verification through a text message anything like that they did send me an email to like confirm my account which you know obviously since the it was the email I used was linked to my personal email account uh, they would send the email to that random DuckDuckGo address, and then DuckDuckGo would forward it to me. So I was able to confirm the email and confirm the account. Um, And then through that, I was able to get registered, download the ISO, um, and then create the uh, uh, virtual machine and test it out. But in doing this, I kind of realized something. I was like, wait a second. There's like a an infinite money glitch type thing going on here. Like I 
don't even have to create a bunch of fake email addresses. I could literally just, you know, refresh the DuckDuckGo random address, copy that, create a new account with a bunch of random data since it's not like they checked any of it aside from my email, which it's a different email from the one I used before, but it's going to my same personal email address. So I could literally make as many of these accounts as I want to get as many counts as I want times 16 instances of Red Hat. So I could basically have as many as I want for free. <laughs> so that's the first part of this infinite money glitch. But it goes deeper than that. Because one thing that I tested in my experimenting around with this was... I installed it into a VM, registered it to the account, and which actually, I, let me back up one step. I did actually create a second account with another randomized DuckDuckGo address, and it worked fine. So I could literally just keep doing this over and over and over again and <laughs> have as many as I want. But, uh, so, but back to the second part of this. So I created a VM in Proxmox, and I registered it to my account, the, the random account that I made. And I got it set up so I could, you know, download packages and install packages and all that stuff. And then I cr converted the VM to a template. So basically what that would allow me to do was just, like, clone it around as many times as I want. And I wouldn't have to worry about reinstalling Red Hat or anything like that. So what I found rather interesting was once I'm, when I had, so I had the template and then I cloned it once and then I cloned it again and I cloned it a third time. So I had three different instances of Red Hat. So I figured, you know, this would add, you know, three new licenses to that Cause, so in the in the Red Hat dashboard, you can basically see like how many uh, subscriptions you have, um, and it basically shows you all the systems that are registered to your account um, for the Red Hat licensing. Um, it's like I mentioned, you could have up to sixteen. And what I found rather interesting was, uh, so as I mentioned, I made three clones of that original VM that I registered. And none of those three VMs showed up in the Red Hat dashboard. So, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, and not only did I clone the three VMs, but I also made sure to make changes to them so that they would be different, so they weren't like, you know, carbon copies. So basically what I would do was I, so the first two what I did was I just straight carbon copied them, cloned them directly, and the only thing I changed was the, like the host name and the IP address so that I wouldn't have IP address conflicts. And I reached out to the Red Hat servers through an, a, you know, an update, like, you know, pull updates, and... I went to check the dashboard and nope, still only showed the one VM that I originally set up, not the other two, which I found very peculiar. And then the third VM, I went a step further and changed the hardware configuration, changed the number of cores, changed the number of, number of memory, and, you know, did this multiple times and still never showed up. <laughs> so it seemed that I, I created this template that was registered, and now it seems like I can just clone this as many times as I want to make as many Red Hat instances as I want, and it's never going to add any more, you know, instances of me registering, quote-unquote, a new instance of Red Hat, which I find absolutely crazy. I don't know if that's a, a bug or a feature, but to me, it's definitely a feature. Um, so I just figured I'd pass this helpful information on to anyone that's that's interested in maybe playing around with this, uh, <laughs> which it, that's just crazy to me that I, I kind of would have thought that, you know, somehow in that process of cloning it, 
it would somehow be able to detect that it's different, but I guess maybe not. Like, especially once I, like, started changing hardware configurations. I thought that that might have been able to set it off, but I guess not. So I guess I can have infinite Red Hat instances now. So, yeah. Uh, you know, infinite money glitch, right? That That's, that's kind of what it is. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so that was... That was interesting. Um, so now on to the next topic that I wanted to talk about. So unless you have been living under a rock for the past, I don't know, a few weeks or so, you've probably heard about the whole debacle and shenanigans going on with a company called FTX and a guy named Sam Bankman Freed. Um, so I, I guess for if, if, on the rare case that someone hasn't heard about what's going on here basically ftx was a cryptocurrency exchange that basically kind of turned out to be a huge scam um people are kind of uh equating it to like the modern day like bernie madoff type thing or like enron or you know any one of those like massive scams that happened so since here in the united states you are innocent until proven guilty. Um, Unless, of course, you're a college student, in which case you're assumed that you're a no-good cheater and you need to have malware installed on your machine in order to make sure that you don't cheat. Um, Yeah, and if that didn't make sense to you, uh, go listen to last week's episode. Uh, But since you are innocent until proven guilty, uh, since Sam Bakeman Freed has not been uh, convicted of anything... Uh, he, it is alleged, put that in quotes, uh, that he committed multiple acts of fraud, money laundering, and violation of political campaign finance regulations, of course, being allegedly. Um, you can take that as you will. Um, but as far as, you know, going back to the whole FTX thing, uh, if you're not familiar with what a crypto exchange is, it's basically uh, a place where you can deposit your Benjis and get Dojis. Uh, It's basically a place where you can deposit money, whether that's basically what they call fiat currency or your dollars, euros, pesos, you know, whatever your country's currency is. And then you can buy crypto with it or swap your crypto for a different form of crypto or whatever. Um, So basically what happened with FTX here was they created their own token called ftt basically out of thin air like any cryptocurrency and they sold it on their platform as a way for people to basically i from my understanding anyway to basically cover their transaction costs which this isn't uncommon for crypto exchanges to do uh one of the other big ones called binance does the exact same thing they have their own binance coin or whatever that you can use to cover your transactions and i think you even get like a some kind of discount if you use it for transactions but you know that's you know neither here nor there but basically what they did was they In creating this FTT token and selling it, they basically, because they created this token out of thin air and sold it, they basically just made money out of nowhere. People buying it, they basically made free money for themselves. And then they used that free money as collateral for stuff, which, I mean, as long as the FTT token had, or I guess maybe that's redundant saying token, whatever, um... Basically, as long as this had value, there wasn't really any issue here. Uh, But then once the value of FTT started tanking, uh, (laughs) things kind of went downhill, and that's how FTX went bankrupt. Um, Now, I hear all of the crypto haters out there saying, well, all cryptocurrencies fake. Like, you're saying that it just came out of nowhere, came out of nothing. All cryptocurrencies fake money. Um, Now... I'm not here to argue one way or the other of if cryptocurrency is good or if cryptocurrency is bad. I'm just here to say and ask you the question, what gives any currency value? Uh, And the answer to that question is the only thing that gives 
anything value or any kind of currency value is people's perception that it has value and the demand for it. And I also should point you to the fact that, for example, U.S. dollars didn't always exist. They had to come out of somewhere. They basically came out of nowhere. The U.S. printed dollars and were like, here, this is our currency. Same thing with basically any other currency. Now, sometimes, you know, the currency was actually based off gold and silver. Uh, but as far as like, you know, printed paper money, that obviously came out of nowhere, came out of nothing, basically like cryptocurrency, except the only difference is the one was created out of nothing by someone and the other was essentially created out of nothing by a government. Um, but the thing, going back to the whole idea of perception of value, um, if you really wanted to, um, like people could, you could use seashells as currency. The reason why seashells aren't used as currency is because people don't perceive them as that valuable. Um, so the the more common something is the less demand people have for it and that's why you could see things like gold and silver keeping their value so well because you know there's a limited amount of it and it's a scarce resource so here's another hypothetical for you so if you were hypothetically trans like transported teleported to an alien planet and you tried to buy something on said alien planet with your United States dollars, I guarantee you when you go to hand that money to them, they're going to look at it and be like, what the heck is this? And totally refuse it because to them it has no value. So, you know, there's there's that aspect to it because they don't value it because to them it doesn't mean anything. Um, so, I mean, the basically the only reason that, you know, governments currency has value is because there's a government behind it saying it has value and people have trust in it and that's basically where the value comes from so the reason crypto has value is because there are people out there that believe it has value and and at the end of the day really any form of currency whether it's cryptocurrency or fiat currency is basically just a standardized way of bartering, if you think about it. Because back in the day, when standard, when like actual currencies didn't exist, the way people would essentially buy or exchange goods is by bartering. And if you say wanted to buy, you know, the loaf of bread that the guy at the market had, you would have to trade him something, and based on what you offered to trade, would basically determine what he would give you in return. So basically the whole point of currency was just to standardize that based on, you know, this has a set value and that that's really all it comes from. Now, back to FTX. So the this whole kind of debacle uh, kind of had some people, I think caused a lot of like distrust in the whole crypto market, which kind of is... Some I guess you could say is unfounded. Some would say it's like totally justified. Um, but the thing that I have to say is I am not here <laughs> to tell you that you should or should not buy cryptocurrency. I'm not a financial advisor. Um, but one thing I will say is this whole thing of people losing billions of dollars should never have happened. And yes, aside from the obvious FTX shouldn't have been scamming people aside, the real reason why no one should have been scammed is because there's a really easy, simple, foolproof way to make sure you never get scammed on a cryptocurrency exchange. And the way you do that is called having your own wallet. So if you're not familiar familiar with how cryptocurrency works, it's like any currency. It's stored in a wallet, except the wallets for cryptocurrency are digital wallets. Now, when you buy cryptocurrency on an exchange, like in this case FTX, which one thing I will mention is before this whole story broke, I had actually never heard of FTX before. Um, so I'm only as familiar with it as basically you all are but anyway if you buy cryptocurrency on say ftx 
or Binance or Coinbase or wherever you buy cryptocurrency, they have their own wallets to store all the cryptocurrency that they hold. Now, while yes, you technically own that crypto, you're storing it in their wallet. So imagine it's like you have your money in the bank, I guess, except the except in this case you have your money in the bank, but the bank isn't like doesn't have the what is that FDIC, I think is what it is. Basically that uh thing that says if the bank like collapses and goes bankrupt or whatever up to I think it's like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars the government will give you that much money back uh so imagine your money is in the bank but that like um stipulation doesn't apply like there is no like if they go under you're gonna get your money back like that that doesn't exist so it, it it's basically like a bank except there's no protection essentially but you also don't get interest either like you would in a bank Anyway, um, so they have wallets. So while technically, yes, you own the crypto, it's stored in their wallet. So if something were to happen to that exchange and your money's in their wallet and all their money goes bye-bye, your money goes bye-bye. <laughs> because like I mentioned, there's no like FDIC reimbursement thing or whatever. Now, any reputable crypto exchange will allow you to transfer your coins or tokens or whatever the crypto is to either another exchange or your own personal wallet. So if you transfer your crypto to your own personal wallet that you either have on, say, like a flash drive, on a virtual machine, on your phone, wherever, because you control that wallet, if something happens to the crypto exchange like FTX and they go belly up, you're nothing happens to your cryptocurrency your cryptocurrency is stored in your own wallet so that crypto exchange goes under no big deal you just if you want to sell your crypto or swap it for something else you just you know go to a different exchange and do it that way um so for example uh let's like for me personally i have multiple cryptocurrency wallets one multiple on vms and multiple on my phone so like i could honestly care less if like a cryptocurrency exchange went under because as soon as i buy crypto on a currency cryptocurrency exchange uh sometimes there's like a, a you know like a window that you have to keep it on there like wow like if you you know transferred funds from like your bank account sometimes you'll have to keep the crypto on there for i don't know like you know, five days or something like that before you're allowed to transfer it off. But basically, as soon as I'm able to transfer it off, I transfer it off into my own personal wallet, and then I don't have to worry about it. So let's give a hypothetical example here. So hypothetically, if I bought $50 worth of Bitcoin from FTX, which like I mentioned, I had no idea FTX, who FTX was and whatever. Um, if I bought $50 worth of Bitcoin and then transferred that Bitcoin to my own wallet, it wouldn't have mattered that FTX went complete belly up and all their assets were gone. Since the wallet is under my control, I control the Bitcoin, and it's not sitting in the wallet on the exchange. So when the exchange goes under, nothing happens to my Bitcoin because my Bitcoin's in my own wallet. Just like if I withdrew all my money from the bank and the bank went under I have all my money I don't have to you know worry about you know having lost money although like if you if you had a of course if you're going through a reputable bank you would have gotten the money back anyway through the whole FDIC thing but assuming the bank didn't have that protection which I guess arguably you probably want to reconsider banking with that bank if they didn't have that protection but regardless um it, it wouldn't matter if that bank goes under if you don't have any money in that bank. Just like if a cryptocurrency exchange goes under and you don't have any crypto on that exchange, then it doesn't matter because you have nothing at stake here. So at the end of the day, if you are buying and selling cryptocurrency, I highly, highly recommend <laughs> that you 
have your own personal wallet, whether that's a wallet on your phone, a wallet on you know your computer or wherever. And that way, the only reason that you would lose your crypto is if you basically lost access to the wallet, which you theoretically shouldn't. Um, and then if whatever exchange you used went under, doesn't matter. You can just go to a different one if what, or whenever you want to sell or swap your cryptocurrency. Now, one thing <laughs> that I need to point out as a disclaimer here is transferring crypto to your own wallet does not prevent you from getting scammed from pump and dumps <laughs> or basically coins that are intentionally meant to be a joke that the whole point of it is for the meme aspect which those coins definitely exist and there are a lot of them uh, so if you're buying those and thinking transferring it to your wallet will prevent it you from losing your money it's not that's not exactly how it works it's like if you put money into a stock that tanks it's i mean you still lost lost money it's you know, it has nothing to do with the exchange. So, like, for example here, if you put uh, $2,000 into poop coin, thinking that it's going to go to the moon, and then it goes to zero, the fact that you have it in your own wallet is not going to help you. Um, and if you're curious, uh, poop coin actually is a legit cryptocurrency. I did not make that up. Uh, if you don't believe me, you can look it up. It is 100% legit. Um, so, yeah, moral of the story here is if you're dealing with any kind of crypto, make sure you have a personal wallet that is off any kind of exchange so you don't have to worry about any of this in the future of exchanges being scams or anything. Because, again, if your money is not on the exchange, it does not matter what happens to it. And then whenever you want to sell, you just transfer your your coins there sell it and then withdraw the money to your bank account and you're fine um so yes crypto is very wild um in case you hadn't noticed um so the last thing that i wanted to talk about for this episode was definitely something very i think lighthearted and kind of fun um and this is the idea of are frameworks programming languages? And at what point does a framework become its own programming language? And I think to understand, we kind of have to look at what a framework is. And when we're talking about frameworks, we're talking about like um, basically like a set of tools or APIs or libraries or basically a compilation of things that you use to build your your programs on um now frameworks are kind of they're kind of like libraries except kind of not like libraries are kind of things that like you would compile your code against to like run certain functions although you could argue certain libraries kind of also fall into this category um but libraries are generally things that you'll like i want to call a function from a library um, to help me do something, whereas a framework is like, I'm going to build my application around this framework. Um, so whereas, for example, like graphics libraries, you're writing most of your own code, but then you're using functions from the graphics library in order to handle the, the graphics aspect. Whereas like, if you were writing uh, a web app or something with like, uh, Node.js or Vue.js or something, that's like its entire framework that you would, you know, build around and build with uh, to make your application. So that's kind of the difference. There's a lot of similarities between the two, and I know a lot of people kind of, like, use them interchangeably, which sometimes it's sometimes sort of justified, other times kind of not. Um, but just know that there is kind of a difference there. But you could definitely kind of make the same argument for both of them. Um, so this idea that like frameworks, both frameworks and libraries essentially have functions that 
for code to do stuff that you didn't write. So for example, like a framework might have a a way to handle the networking for you. So you instead of like having to create the sockets and, you know, create the handlers and all that yourself, you would basically just call the functions built into the framework that would do it all for you. Or say uh, you could have part of the framework to, you know, handle your file input and output or handle your logging for you or, or, or something like that. But the thing with frameworks is because you get to this point where because you're building around the framework and the framework is like the main point of the program that you're building around and you're using the framework uh, to kind of make the code that you want at a certain point. When does it become its own programming language? Because, yeah, sure, like, if you're using, you know, Node.js or some other framework, yeah, it's written on top of a programming language. But depending on how much of the framework you're using, you're kind of mostly only using the framework, and at which point all those functions and all those classes and everything that's built into the framework is separate from the base programming language that you're working in. So if you're basically totally programming in this framework, yeah, you're going to have to, you know, write for loops and while loops and if statements and all that stuff. But like all the other things you're doing is strictly focused on the syntax for the framework, making sure that you're calling the right functions to do what you want with the framework. And at that point, it kind of sort of becomes its own programming language in a way. Now, you could also argue <laughs> with this idea that a framework is something that you kind of build around and it's built on top of a programming language. You could kind of argue that C++ is just a framework for C because if you make a C program you could literally change it from a .c file to a .cpp file and then compile it with the C++ compiler and it'll work just fine so in a way because C++ is kind of like an addition or a building upon of C you could kind of argue here <laughs> that C++ is just a framework for C. But also, it's generally agreed upon that C++ is its own programming language. So where is the line between a framework and a programming language? Now, arguably, C++ is absolutely massive and there's a ton of stuff to it, and I don't think anyone would realistically call it a framework, but the fact that it's literally built on top of C, and C code works perfectly fine in C++, that's kind of, you know, the definition of how frameworks work. Like, if I'm building around a given framework, right, I could, if it's, say, uh, a framework for Java, I could write Java code that would essentially do stuff that the framework could do for me, but I just don't call those framework functions, and I just write my own Java code to do it, and that's perfectly valid. Just like in C and C++, I can write my own C code that would do the same thing that um, C++ would do, and it's perfectly valid. A great example of this is the string lib is the strings, right? The string functions in C++. I can, instead of, you know, using those strings, I can use character arrays and do it C style, and that's perfectly valid in a C++ program. Um, so, like, the, the question has to be asked, where is the line? Like, when does a framework become its own programming language? Because there are programming languages that are super niche. Like, there is the R programming language, which is, like, literally just used for data science. Like, 
that's it. <laughs> like there are programming languages that are like that literally just have super niche uh, aspects to them that are like super niche use cases, which is basically what frameworks are. They're like niche use cases for you to build around like certain types of applications. So, you know, are those niche programming languages just frameworks? Because they got to be built on something. I mean, at the end of the day, at the very least, every programming language is at least built on binary or assembly or, you know, computer language, right? So it's every every programming language is built on something. So at what point, where is the line between programming language and framework? Now, obviously, this is, you know, a very lighthearted discussion. Uh, <laughs> there's obviously, you know, um, you know, obvi there's obviously differences between, you know, something that is specifically designed as a framework versus a programming language. But at the end of the day, if you're <laughs> once you like if you actually program with these frameworks, you get to the point where you're calling and using more functions from the framework than the actual programming language that you're supposedly writing in in the first place and you kind of feel like uh the framework that you're writing f writing with is essentially its own programming language because everything is you know part of the framework and not actually part of the base programming language so <laughs> it's it's a fun you know fun little uh discussion to have which i think we definitely needed this kind of you know light-hearted uh fun thought-provoking discussion, uh, especially after last week's episode, um, and maybe the depressingness of FTX, but I mean, uh, I thought this was a, a, a nice, fun exercise uh, to talk about. This in combination with the, uh, the infinite money glitch with Red Hat, um, I think this was definitely much more of a positive episode uh, than last week, for sure. Um, so if you enjoyed this episode, um, I ask that you leave it a rating and review and subscribe to the Dark Assassins podcast if you haven't done so already. Also, be sure to share with a friend or family member, uh, especially if you have anyone that's interested in getting into Red Hat. Uh, now they can essentially install it as many times as they want for free. Um, so definitely uh, share this podcast with those who uh, would need it, like friends or family. Um, and if you have any questions about this episode or have any questions that you want me to answer in a future episode uh shoot me an email at contact at darkassassinsinc.com there is a link for that down in the show notes below and that's going to do it for me in this episode of the dark assassins podcast until next time my fellow assassins remember bull nothing equals true if action not equal to null return true i'll see you next time on the dark assassins podcast <laughs>